When it comes to handheld radio communications, there are a lot of things to consider. Radios, propagation, antennas, all of this can get really complicated really quickly. But one major concern that a lot of people have these days is privacy. With government surveillance and big tech censorship increasing to staggering levels, more and more average people are considering handheld radios as a viable means of communication for everything from emergencies to daily communication that is a bit more private than a smartphone. So when it comes to specifically handheld radio communications, we like to think of two main avenues of approach. Number one is what you communicate, and two is who you communicate to. There is a third factor who might be listening, but we'll address this as we go along. These factors will dictate how you choose to communicate. To put this into a succinct statement, really what we are trying to define is our intent, which is to establish secure voice or text communications between small, localized groups of trusted individuals without using pre-established infrastructure. And to do this, we are going to use this illustration to show the increasingly more effective ways that you can prevent people from hearing and understanding your communication. As we go from the bottom of the pyramid to the top, we get more complex and more difficult, which in turn means that fewer and fewer people can intercept and understand your communications. Now granted, no communication form is foolproof, least of all radios. So all we are trying to do is do our best to limit who can hear and understand our communications. But before we get too far into this, we have to touch on the legality of things. I only mention this because the self-appointed internet division of the FCC will show up in the comment section to educate everyone using their vast knowledge of legal expertise. Anyone who spends even just five minutes around the ham radio community knows that it is unfortunately filled with a lot of people that are more concerned with memorizing the FCC's arbitrary, confusing, contradictory, and nonsensical rules rather than helping people. I'm cooperating. I never met this man before. I hate the Constitution. I hate free speech. I'll stitch. I know things. What on the earth? Domination. Fair warning, sir. Running out to the additional $80 to your fine. And for people like this, my decorum, my respect, and my patience has run out. It's not a tantrum, and I'm not jealous. I'm just fed up. If you are one of the ham radio operators who does this at a time when we need to encourage people to help us develop and modernize this technology, you are destroying your own hobby. So chill out. Of course, since there are most likely federal agencies surveilling this video, we are obligated to say don't do anything illegal, always obey the holy scripture from the FCC. Yada, yada, yada. However, it is up to you whether or not you want to follow the FCC's rules or not. The only person that is responsible for your actions is you. So today we are going to be talking a lot about this middle ground right here. And as such, we are not going to talk about the legality so much, but rather focus on what is technologically possible rather than what is legally possible. Really, the only significant reason for bringing this up in the first place is because laws do matter when it comes to what a company is willing to invest their time and effort to build. If something is questionably legal or is not legal at all, a company in the United States is not going to invest the time and energy to build such a technology out. Even if something is technologically possible, the laws are going to hold a company back from doing what they want to do or what the customers want to do. So today we're going to talk about the law as little as possible and only when it is really a barrier to you using or even owning a certain technology. So let's dive right into this. One of the major considerations for radio communications is what frequency you choose. So first up is VHF and UHF. These are the bands that are responsible for ensuring the overwhelming majority of all line of sight communications. Everything from your Baofeng to what we call bubble pack radios that you can pick up at really any store these days, that's what these radios will use most of the time. And this is because there are ways to use these radios without a license legally, or quasi-legally. Is using a Baofeng on FRS or GMRS frequencies illegal? Maybe, maybe not. Depending on who you ask. If you ask the hams, everything's illegal. But if you use a cheap Baofeng on an FRS frequency, will anyone, even the FCC or other hams, even know about it? Uh, the answer to that is no. There's no way you can detect that. But that's a different story with the next one, HF radio. 
HF Radio is kind of out of place on this chart, and honestly it requires its own video. It doesn't deserve to be in this little pyramid here, because it's genuinely a fascinating frequency range that offers a lot of very interesting capabilities. But, we haven't found any quasi-legal way to use HF Radio without a license. Right to jail, right away. And since HF Radio offers an extremely long range, a lot of people can hear and triangulate you. And, since it's the staple of amateurs, you will find it very hard to rely on HF radio as the bread and butter of your communications plan. Moving on up, we come to a handful of very obscure bands. This is something that you can research on your own a bit, because each radio band has its ups and downs. But you might find that a good way to increase your privacy is to operate on bands and frequencies that not many people use. And one of the better bands for this is the 700, 800, and 900 megahertz bands. This is what many police and commercial radios use, specifically because it's far away from the traditional VHF, UHF bands. Granted, these days these frequencies are becoming more popular among amateurs, but for now it's still not that common in many areas, simply because there aren't too many radios capable of transmitting and receiving in this frequency range, and the ones that do are very expensive. But up here at the top is essentially summarizing the best parts of all of these tactics, using frequencies that nobody uses, or frequencies that are slightly out of band but are still within the transmitting capability of the radio you are using, or transmitting really close to or even in between the offsets of something else to confuse people trying to direction find you, or using wide non-standard offsets to confuse scanners or hams who are used to a 600 kilohertz offset. Or using a radio with a very high selectivity, meaning that you can squeeze in your transmission into places where normally you wouldn't find a transmission. Depending on what radios you have, and what you are willing to do, and what you're willing to spend your money on, there are a lot of things that can be done to make your communications a bit more private just by choosing the right frequency. Next up is a much larger topic than we can talk about here, but it is the eternal question of analog versus digital radio. Most people that try to get into radio by buying a couple of cheap Balfangs might not even know that digital radio exists. Again, this is some more homework for you, but the short version is that the overwhelming number of radios on the market, most if not all Balfangs, all bubble pack radios, and most radios that hams use are analog, meaning that they transmit an analog signal. Digital radios, which use a digital signal, are less common, but they are becoming more and more popular every day. In fact, their popularity has exploded in recent years because there's a lot of benefits to using them. You can look into the differences and the pros and cons of each, but here's what we think. For a professional, non-hobby use, there are very few reasons to use analog radios anymore. For one, you cannot encrypt analog signals. Several companies have tried with things like voice inversion, but there is nothing that can't easily be cracked in real time by someone who knows what they're doing. And that's a deal breaker for many people, so if you're trying to use encryption of any kind, your only option is digital. Digital signals are also much more clear than analog, and digital signals have a farther range than analog at the same power level. And there are lots of different digital modes that you can choose from, so you can take your pick. This is just a handful of the sort of the most common ones. The downsides of digital radio are really just threefold. One, digital radios are more expensive, and so that's really a barrier for a lot of people. Number two is that there is no quasi-legal way to use a digital radio without a license. So there's really no way to get around that unless you don't care about that. And finally, which is really the biggest problem and one that we're currently working on right now, is that digital radio modes like DMR, which is the most common one, are really, really hard to build the repeaters for. With an analog radio, you can literally buy two Baofengs and build a repeater in 10 minutes. It's, it's that easy. So that's really one of the main reasons to keep analog radio around for professional uses sometimes. Because if you want to build a repeater on digital radio like DMR, it is not easy to do. Most people in the ham radio world use hotspots instead of repeaters, which is its own rabbit hole you can go down. But the bottom line is that unless you've got significant technical skill to build one, 
or have several thousands of dollars laying around to buy a commercial repeater. Using digital radios with repeaters is not really feasible at this time. But that's changing. In the next couple of years, that will be a, an incorrect statement because right now a lot of people are working on figuring out how to more easily build digital radio repeaters. And on to the topic that everyone has been waiting for, encryption. Encryption is one of those touchy subjects among hams. Most will tell you that encryption is illegal and you go directly to jail, do not pass go, or collect your $200 for even thinking about using it. No trial, no, no nothing. But that's not true. You can legally use encryption on your radios in a few specific circumstances and situations. But we can get into the dirty details of that later if anyone really cares. The reason for bringing this up is to explain the very first level of encryption in heavy air quotes because it's not encryption at all. And that is what we generally call privacy tones. I only put this on here because I wanted to stress how you should not use these. Privacy tones, also sometimes called CTCSS tones or PL tones, are not private. All they do is prevent you from hearing someone else on your frequency. These do not stop anyone from hearing you. They only stop you from hearing some random person that might also be on your frequency. So they provide negative levels of privacy because someone is probably listening to you, but you have no idea because you think you're safe. So do not use these if you're concerned about privacy because I really don't know how companies have been able to get away with marketing privacy tones on their radios because it doesn't do that. Up next on the chart are digital modes, which we've already talked about. Again, digital systems by themselves are not encrypted, but digital signals can only be heard by digital radios, whereas analog signals can be heard by analog and digital radios, usually. So since encryption is such a touchy subject in the ham community, a culture has emerged in which hams try to comply with the law, but still make it harder to hear. And digital radio is pretty good for this, especially considering the popularity of the Baofeng radios. Love it or hate it, Baofeng has sold millions of those radios globally. So in almost every single area in the United States, in every single town in this country, there's going to be someone who can hear your UHF or VHF transmission. But if you are using a digital radio, even without encryption, the number of people that can understand that transmission will be astronomically low. The transmission, if you try to listen to a digital transmission on an analog radio, it just comes across as clicking and unintelligible. You can't hear anything. Uh, you can hear sound, but you can't actually hear people talking, right? And speaking of doing things to reduce the number of people that can hear you, but still remain legal by not using encryption, look no further than your local police department. Public service entities, but particularly law enforcement agencies, have, over the years, been going to what are called trunked radio systems. Now, we can get into the weeds for this later, and we've already talked about this a bit, but the short and simple version is that most trunked radio systems use complex digital modes, which make it very difficult for someone to hear, even if they are listening out for it on a digital radio. Most of these systems are not encrypted, so that they remain within the laws that are meant to ensure transparency between police and taxpayers. A lot of states and cities and local areas have restrictions on local law enforcement using encryption in their radios. Like they, they'll say, like a city council will say, "Hey, look, you can't use encryption on your standard dispatch radios, but you can use encryption on your like your SWAT team radios and stuff like that." Um, but the complexity of these systems means that you often need to buy a specific police scanner that is capable of decoding or demodulating the police communications in your local area. Now granted, many police departments around the country are just skipping right past this and going to fully encrypted radios regardless of whatever transparency laws exist. But moving on up, within the hand radio or commercial business communities, we have what we can genuinely call true encryption. Many commercial Chinese radios quietly offer this for their radios. Again, since encryption is not encouraged at all within the ham radio community, if you were to look up a review for a radio on YouTube or something, most hams won't even mention the encryption feature. But in many cases, you will see uh, like basic or enhanced encryption in the programming software for a particular radio that has it. And there's a little bit of a problem with this. 
For one, almost all of these encryption methods are proprietary and closed source. So even if you do find a radio that advertises encryption, unless you are highly technically skilled, there's no way for you to verify that the message is actually encrypted to the level that the company claims. For instance, a lot of companies will advertise that their, quote, enhanced encryption is 128-bit, which isn't great, but it's better than nothing, I guess. But when people on the internet do their thing and investigate, we find that due to the math and some other weird stuff that's complex to understand, it's really just 40-bit encryption, which is really easily crackable in real time by anyone who knows what they're doing. These weird proprietary encryption methods might work for you. Uh, something like this will prevent the kid down the block with a walkie-talkie from understanding you, but the closed source nature of a lot of this stuff is really hard to find. Seriously, we have scraped the absolute bottom of the internet to find random forum posts from 10 years ago or a comment on a blog or a news article from 5 years ago about a specific radio's encryption capabilities. It's just not easy to find any information on this stuff, so really the final option is what most people will end up with. By far, the only encryption that we think is worth using for any serious use is AES-256. 256-bit encryption is the gold standard for all encryption at this current time. This is simply the best you can do. AES-256 is open source and it's the only encryption standard approved by the NSA to handle top secret information. Right now, the undisputed leader of radio encryption is Motorola. For those of you who have been following us for a while, you know our strong feelings about Motorola as a company. Around here, Motorola and the ATF compete for our attention for what we think is the most totalitarian entity in the United States. But Motorola created the AES-256 standard for how it applies to radios. And as such, they are the top dog when it comes to radio encryption because many companies use Motorola standard for their own radios. So if you're trying to go for encryption, AES-256 is the best you're going to get, although be prepared to pay for it. But there is something else to think about. We dedicate a lot of time and effort to trying to hide our radio transmissions, so much so that we forget to ask ourselves this question. Is it even worth hiding what you say if your transmission can be geolocated? Now we have talked about this in greater detail in a previous video, so if you are interested in learning more, please check out our video on radio direction finding. We are literally showing you how people or agencies can hunt you down via the transmissions you emit on a daily basis. So for those who just want the short version, here's a quick rundown of what we're trying to explain. Imagine that you are running a surveillance operation and you're trying to find out where a certain person is transmitting from. Well, if you intercept transmissions from these areas marked by the red dots on the screen, this doesn't really tell you much. The person transmitting can be over here on the left, they can be down the road on the right, they can be in this little green area down to the south. You can't really tell where they're located. But if we wait a little while and we pick up more transmissions, the picture becomes even more clear, and we can narrow this down to a specific house. This is what happens in modern warfare. Those transmissions can have the most secure, uncrackable encryption ever. But if the transmission alone is in the same area every time, an adversary does not need to understand what's being said to target that site. So never forget that you can spend thousands of dollars on a radio and encrypt it with the highest levels of encryption. But if you are constantly transmitting from the place that you sleep at night, that's probably not a good idea. So for us, in our specific situation, and for the things that we need radios for, radio direction finding, or RDF, is by far the biggest concern. So how do we address that? Well, the first way is by using a low power level. The general rule of thumb in the radio community is to only use enough power to complete the communication. This is something that is often forgotten by most people that have radios. So what does this look like in practice? Jumping back to our map here, let's say that we are located in this house right here at the upper left, and we need to communicate with a person or a team that is operating down somewhere in this little red blob. But we also have an adversary within the battle space located up here to the top right, a radio listening post which is trying to intercept our communications. Do we now see why the topics we've covered before are useful? All of this comes together in situations like this. But anyway, let's say that we need to communicate with these dudes over here without the guys in the listening post hearing us. 
Well, in this specific situation, if we blast out our radio at maximum power, everyone's going to hear us, which is not only good for counter-surveillance, but it also allows us to be jammed very easily, which is not good. But if we dial the power down, we might have a chance at being heard by our guys, but not the adversarial force. Granted, this is impossible to know. Radio wave propagation is some weird stuff, and strange things happen all the time. Plus, you are never really going to know where a surveillance site is located. But ideally, you would be able to use just barely enough power to get the job done without any interruptions. Of course, it can be a bit nerve-wracking to be constantly on the edge of not having comms, but it's all a balance. A nice safety barrier is good to have in case things change or the AO shifts or whatever. But the overall point is that using only the power that you need is crucial and always a good thing to do. But there is something else that we can do. And this is where things get even more complicated. We can use terrain masking and directional antennas to make sure that the signal we're transmitting only goes where we want it to. Right down here at the bottom are what we call omnidirectional antennas. These antennas are what most people think of when they get into radios, and these are the kinds of antennas that will come with your radio when you buy it. These antennas emit a signal in every direction equally. But what if you were to use an antenna that points the signal in only one direction? So if we jump back to our map here, we can see that this signal right here, our previous signal with our omnidirectional antenna, is a circular shape. Now this is slightly inaccurate because of many factors. Many people think of radio signals like a circle or a bubble, but that's not quite right, especially in urban environments. But just for this example, a circular transmission area is good enough to illustrate what using an omnidirectional antenna would do. This is what it would look like. But let's say that the listening post, your adversary that is trying to intercept you, is closer than the people you're trying to talk to. Well, that's a problem because you can't reduce your power enough to really matter because then only the people that are in the listening post can hear you. So for this, we can use what's called a directional antenna. This will beam your transmission along a certain path rather than every direction. So by using a directional antenna, you can easily reduce the number of people that can intercept your transmission. Really, the only way to intercept this kind of transmission is to be located between each person transmitting. This would also mean that directional signals are very hard to jam because the jammer would need to be using an insane amount of power or be located along the transmitting axis. You can also do this with terrain, transmitting down a valley, using the mountains on either side of the valley to bounce the signal down like a bowling ball down a lane with the gutters up. But this obviously relies on the terrain cooperating. And since most people live in cities, which are notorious for creating radio problems of their own, directional antennas are usually a better bet. And coming back to our chart here, just like everything else we've talked about, we can layer this one with other tactics. We can use a directional antenna in conjunction with cooperating terrain. We can also add in repeaters, which mask the true transmission site so that if someone far away hears you and tries to direction find the transmission site, chances are they're going to find the repeater instead of you. Using a directional antenna to hit a repeater that is off-site, a repeater which itself is connected to a directional antenna to transmit to a final site, man, that would be pretty effective at confusing anyone who's trying to figure out what's going on, much less anyone who's trying to triangulate you. Of course, directional antennas have disadvantages too. Directional antennas are not super great for mobile applications. And you have to know where the other guy is in order to point the antenna in their direction. But if you have pre-established communications windows and procedures, directional antennas are really hard to beat for just being a bit more secure in your communications. But remember, when it comes to sending information via the radio waves, we don't even necessarily need to use our voice to send that information a lot of times. And generally speaking, just like how power level affects the number of people that can hear us, if someone is trying to scan for a frequency or, or scan for a transmission, the length of time of your transmission uh, also matters very significantly. Generally speaking, the longer you hit that push to talk button, the longer you're transmitting, the longer that you spend talking on the radio, the easier it is for people to find out where you are. 
So right down here at the bottom is what we call rag chewing. Now this is just ham radio slang for hopping on the radio, you know, for hobby uses, just to have a good time and talk with your friends on the radio, um, not worrying at all about who's listening to you or and not worrying about direction finding at all. That's okay for a hobby use, but in a tactical scenario, you don't want to do this. This is not good. You don't want to just spend your entire day on the radio transmitting with really long transmissions of like sometimes a minute or two minutes or more. That's, that's not uh, something that's good when you're trying to limit the number of people that can hear you. So really the best thing, the, the best practice for voice communications is to keep your voice communications as short as you possibly can. But sometimes even a voice message is too long. Uh, how long does it take for you to read a sentence out loud? It takes you several seconds. But what if you could type out your message and send it in less than, less than half a second? Uh, a lot of DMR radios nowadays, a lot of digital radios, come with a texting feature uh, that allow you to send a, a text message uh, to another radio or a radio that's you know part of your group, uh, and that message is going to take just fractions of a second to send because it's sending, it's compressing all of those characters down to a very small size. So you really, you're only exposing yourself for a very short period of time. Now, something to keep in mind, as I have indicated here on the screen, is that many DMR text messaging features on most digital radios are not encrypted. So you're sending this message in the clear over the airwaves, so anyone can read it. That's something to keep in mind. Another more well-known method of sending data over the airwaves is what's called APRS, or Automated Packet Reporting System, or Automated Position Reporting System, depending on who you ask. Uh, most people just call it packet radio, and this is its own rabbit hole. Again, some more homework for you to look into, but this is really fascinating. You can use APRS to do things like send emails and uh, send text messages and weather reports and automatically report your position without using uh, some kind of cellular service. Uh, it's very interesting, and there's a lot of different ways you can use APRS, and it's a little bit more well-known than a lot of these proprietary texting um, services that are on DMR radios. They're usually proprietary, whereas APRS is really more of a standard. And then finally, just like a few of our other categories, we can layer all of this stuff together. We can use encrypted text-based communication and voice communication only when it's absolutely needed. And even then, short transmissions from multiple locations. If you do this, you're limiting the amount of time that you're spending transmitting your location out in the form of uh, your, your radio signal getting out there. So remember, the shorter you can keep your communications, the better. And a good way to do that is by sending data instead of voice. And finally, we come to one of the more um, contentious subjects that not a lot of people talk about, but it's definitely a factor. And that is what we're calling the family factor or the convenience factor. In other words, how easy is your setup to use with your family who might not care about radios? Uh, this is something that a lot of people deal with. It's just everybody knows, you know, hey, when... So, you know, the radio guy in the family is bringing the radios out and nobody really pays attention. It's something that's really hard for people to understand. And depending on the complexity of your system, you're gonna, you might have to choose a less ideal situation, a less ideal setup, just because a, a setup that you use that's less ideal is better than the best system that you don't use. So right down here at the bottom, you might have, you know, uh, small kids who, who you're trying to get into to radio and all they can handle is a small, cheap Baofeng or that's all you want to invest in them uh, because, you know, they'd be young kids or something like that. Hey, there you go. That could be a great option. Um, if you've got some older folks around who, who might uh, understand um, digital radios or, or they might be able to, to handle the responsibility of a, you know, $100 plus digital radio, then you can go with digital. And with digital radios, it was analog ones too, you can program the front front face so that really the only thing they can do is push the push to talk button and change the volume. Uh, so if you're worried about people kind of uh, messing around with systems and, and your settings, 
uh, you can do that very easily. And then moving on up, we can move into encryption. Now, uh, depending on your level of expertise and how people understand how keys work and things like that, you might have to choose a less ideal encryption method that's a little bit simpler to understand. Or you might be the tip of the spear and you might be running a, a small local group of, you know, uh, people who are in your trusted group and they understand the, the impact of radios and they're, they're responsible enough um, and they're willing to spend the money on a $5,000 radio uh, to run some AES 256-bit encrypted you know, radio on really strange frequencies and, and take that responsibility to the next level. So you always have to consider convenience or your, your family in, in your decision-making process because chances are if you've made it this far into the video, you're going to be interested in providing a set of radios. You might have a family you're trying to buy radios for to, to make sure that your family unit is good to go. You might have some friends and neighbors who you might want to purchase radios for. Or you might have a group of buddies who are trying to get together and buy radios as like a group so that you all are on the same page with things. Um, and the convenience factor is something you have to consider. Uh, if you get a really expensive radio that nobody wants to use because it's inconvenient or they don't know how to use it, well, you know, that's probably a little bit of a waste. Uh, whereas you could go with a, a slightly less ideal radio setup, uh, but it's a lot more convenient for people to use or more durable or something like that. So this is something to consider when you're trying to pick out what kind of radios to use. So when we add all of this stuff together, really our goal is to pick the best practices from all of the stuff we've talked about and implement it as best you can. But let me tell you something. The coolest dudes on the internet still haven't figured this out. The super secret tier 1 ranger sniper delta seals still do not have ways of meeting all of these criteria at the same time. But on the civilian side of things, when it comes to ensuring the survivability and the utility of your communications networks and implementing this into your daily life, not just on the weekends when you go to the range, this is going to give you capabilities when others, even the U.S. government, does not have those capabilities. I know we dedicate a lot of time to talking capabilities, and I guess we can only beat this into people's heads so much. But I am asking you, please, 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 at least try to figure out this kind of stuff for yourself. I am pleading with you to pay attention to the boring stuff, such as communications. Because communications is a great equalizer. Just like weather, communications has historically been the reason for both resounding success and the abysmal failure of military operations around the world. I know this stuff is boring and sometimes hard to understand. I get it, I really do. My own brain is not wired to understand most of this stuff either. And we here can try to help with the complex nature of this stuff by helping make things a little easier to understand. But these days we are facing diminishing returns when it comes to trying to convince people to pay attention to the stuff that isn't entertaining. If it isn't a video about a rifle or a plate carrier, people just turn it off. If it isn't entertaining, people don't want to watch it. This mentality has got to stop. We are not going to make it out of these tough times unless we start reading books and learning skills that aren't just confined to the cool stuff in the tactical arena. So let's do that. If our YouTube analytics are any indicator, if you made it this far into the video on this topic, you are already ahead of the curve. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. The people who need to watch this video in its entirety, the people that we are pleading with to start learning skills, are the people who clicked out of this video right at the beginning when they realized it wasn't going to be entertaining. So congratulations, you were already on your way to figuring out which path you need to take when it comes to your own communications. For us, this is not a game. This is not a hobby. This is an attempt to use one of the only existing technologies that humanity has in order to ensure that we have basic capabilities when powerful companies and or nation states decide they don't want us to communicate. The past two years have strongly indicated that internet and cellular communications are not reliable. Cellular communications are not reliable due to everything from censorship to mass surveillance. And internet-based communications? Well, not only is that more vulnerable than we think from everything from recreational vehicle owners to Russian submarines, but the entire concept of the internet, the very core and basic levels of how packets of data are sent and received has, in our opinion, been corrupted to the point that investing time and effort into new internet-based communications is not exactly a feasible enterprise. 
We have gotten a taste of this in recent years. It doesn't matter how secure your communications method is. It doesn't matter how great your new social media app is. If your entire domain can be delisted by the one or two companies that own the majority of internet traffic. Investing time to research and develop out our own independent communications networks from the ground up is, in our opinion, a much more worthwhile venture at this stage. And the field of radio is really one of the only options that exists. We believe that we as a people can do this. But the biggest barrier, like everything else in life, is ourselves. We have got to force ourselves to choke down this information and understand it. Ever wonder how social media companies now control the majority of communication and information in the world? Ever wonder how they did that? Because they had the technical knowledge and we did not. So let's change that. Let's become experts on this stuff and build our own communications networks. Sure, spending 19 hours on YouTube watching videos about guns you don't even own is perfectly fine if that's what you want to do. But you know what else is cool? Being strategically and tactically superior in the fields that are boring. If even the highest tiers of special operators can't even fill their own radio and just get their echo to do it, but you, as a private citizen, can set up your own extensive covert networks and bounce radio signals around like it's child's play, you will run circles around any adversary you might face. So if you can do all of this and still say what you want to say and say it to only the people who you want to hear it, well, then you're going to be a very, very capable force. And finally, when it comes to the eternal question that will surely be asked, what radio do I need to buy that will enable me to meet all of these criteria? The answer that I'm sure everyone is tired of hearing is it depends. There is no one radio that can fulfill all of these criteria. But you can get really close. So this is going to require its own video on the topic. Right now, there aren't too many options out there for people who want to use radios like we do, so we can cover this in a separate video because it can get really confusing and technical really quickly. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, if you do not have a radio just yet, you can learn. The internet, with all of its faults, is still a great place for learning new skills. And recently, there has been a lot of content within the field of ham radio that you can use to help understand basic principles and try to figure out what you will need to meet the criteria that matters to you. So stay tuned for more on this infinitely large topic, and we will see you next time. And as always, Fight in the shade.